All right. Hello, it is Tony Zerbin and Tara Boothby, both Alberta psychologists at Sojourn Psychology. And we have been thinking and bouncing some ideas back and forth about contemplation and contentment. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I think it makes sense to me why you and I sort of got it noticing this because what I notice is a shared interest is we kind of like Anglican fathers and we follow them on Facebook or no Instagram and then mm -hmm. we share memes. So it's like, it makes sense. I'm like, you try to think, why are Tony and I talking about this? <laughs> I'll offer another piece of it too. I'm reading another book, and this is by um, an Orthodox scholar, not necessarily an Anglican father. Um, and he had this funny little line he put at the beginning too. He said, when it comes to counselors, psychologists, and, the, and their uh, related professions, you can look at them as successful philosophers because they're applied philosophers. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I mean, shots fired. But I mean, so much of what I do with clients, even in the preamble to the conversation we had before this, was talking about how we use words to, to really have a, a deep impact for clients. Um, an example I was giving is if we talk about, say, contemplation, even making space for contemplation is really hard for some people to do. And a word I've been using with my clients a lot is I say, can I do some jujitsu with what you just said? And they're like, what? What's jujitsu? And the whole art of jujitsu, it's a philosophy of movement. Um, yeah, somatic psychologist, right? And the art of jujitsu is if somebody throws a punch your way, rather than blocking it, rather than just sidestepping it, you take their punch and you add your force to it. And they, and they go flying, right? So you're using their move, their intention yeah. to your advantage. Now, I don't want that to sound manipulative. So how I do this for clients is I say, I'm going to use words that use your values to help you understand something that your values don't otherwise have a category for. So a recent example of this is some people carry a lot of responsibility and they are the go-to people for creating structure, for making sure life is ordered, for making sure they get all these things done. And I was working with this client trying to help create a space for relaxation and rest, for at least slowing down. And that can bring up so much crap, so much shame, so much guilt, so much those like two o'clock in the morning memories, that kind of stuff. And you don't want to do that during the day. So I was saying, instead of doing that, we're going to, Actively create structure where you have a date with yourself, not a friend. And then your job is to actively be passive. I want you to intentionally be part of the scenery, mm. right? So for a real go-getter, this is a way of structuring your thoughts to create space to do something you otherwise yeah. just smash into. And then this fits so lovely and so well with what, what we're going to, what we're leading into with this mm -hmm. contentment and contemplation or contemplation and contentment. Mm -hmm. And I like that somatic metaphor. And then from a, a attachment focused clinical view or um, an emotionally focused clinical view, two big things that we talk about to help clients um move through their emotion or move with their emotion is uh getting really explicit yeah. so why that works in therapy to get really explicit is because we don't do a good job of getting really explicit with ourselves <laughs> outside no. exactly <clears throat> and that's 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 what we're going to talk about right now the other thing that we do is we could talk about slicing it thinner yes so in an emotionally focused therapy session, we might just focus on one little thing. Yeah. I just feel so unlovable. We talk about it for an hour. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of power, like you said, in that, even that punch. There's mm -hmm. a lot of movement. Emotion is motion. There's a lot yeah. of motion. Yes. Connected with that emotion. Yeah. And 
we we don't slow down enough to assess all of that motion. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's beautiful. How do we land it in a way that actually works for you? Right. Yeah. The jujitsu is not against you personally, it's against defenses that aren't working for you anymore. They did to a degree at one time in your life, but if they're not working for you anymore, there's a reason you're in my office. Yeah, and like with jujitsu in particular, which I know nothing about uh, uh, other than the fact that people who, <laughs> who practice martial arts go to uh, um, yes. a facility. Yeah. with other people and they yeah. spar and they practice and they're in the community and they're rarely actually outside using it as right. a defensive violent force exactly so and it, yet, does, it does fit it, it fits and they never use they almost never they they work really hard not to have to use it yeah. outside yeah but it still has so many benefits that it brings with you right yeah. And the thing I love highlighting about somebody who's really good at doing jujitsu is they don't have to work very hard. How many of us feel like we're overstretched? We don't have enough energy, that we're working way too hard. So my goal is to come alongside you and say, hey, let's not work really hard against your defenses. Let's use your defenses in a way that takes very little energy, but actually works for you. <clears throat> yeah, let's get slow down. Let's slow down. Mm -hmm. let's, get, let's get thinking and feeling and mm -hmm curious exactly so i want to i want to jump into really getting specific about um, yes contemplation to start but before we do that i was thinking how do i define contentment mm. and so i want to put it out here at the front so then maybe we can come back to refine it or notice as you bet yeah so i'm thinking my definition of contentment is um, that I'm within my ideals for my humanity. Oh, I love that. <laughs> good. Yeah. good start. We're off to a great start. I'm feeling good. <laughs> no, I, I love that. Okay. So, yes. I, okay, I already have an idea of how we can get there. Okay. But we'll slow it down and slice it down along the way. Perfect. <laughs> So before we started, I one curiosity I have is because we always start with a nugget, a little slug of a thought. And then it's mm -hmm. like, okay, well, this hits somewhere. How do we make it walk? Yeah. And I asked, well, how do you make a difference between reflection and contemplation? Right. I mean, I had to sit with it for myself because I hadn't until a couple of minutes ago. And what I offer is that contemplation is thinking about something that's outside of you right and finding ways to bring it in or to join it to participate in it right reflection is about something related to you you reflect on your day you reflect on what you did you reflect on what you didn't do and you say what worked what didn't but when you say about contentment being living within your ideals for your humanity Mm -hmm. contemplation often is looking outside of yourself and saying well what is my purpose of humanity what's my goal for humanity what is humanity outside of me and how do i measure up with it yeah how do i perceive humanity and my ideals and my ideals and then again from an attachment point of view a big bulk of our work is understanding our views of self our views of others and our views of the world mm -hmm. and then looking at those problematic views problematic views of humanity yeah and helping to find new views of self others in the world yeah which fits with this this contemplation and contentment so contemplation and contentment kind of like they're they're a bit buzzy right now buzzwords in yes. different communities but they're kind of both words for me where Meh. Mm. No, I don't. I don't necessarily get slow enough to think about what is contemplation. Mm. And I like what you're saying. There is more of a spiritual vibe when we associate an experience of contemplation versus reflection. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I think of it in terms of advice I was given when I was learning how to drive. Mm. Right. And our we were taught defensive driving. You know, I think. Got some kind of like discount on something for doing that class. It's kind of 
I didn't really, really appreciate it fully at the time. But something that really stuck with me is our instructor said, where you look is the direction your car is going to go in. Right? And you're looking at something outside of your car and you're moving in that direction. Yes. So what our picture of humanity or anthropology or what our ideals are actually matters in a really practical way that way. And if we, and if we don't have an idea of that we're moving towards, that's how many of us feel so aimless and listless and, and we feel so restless and incomplete at the end of the day. We're like, what am I even doing? Where am I going? Life is aimless. It's a really useful word there too. So contemplation can be like, Hey, I want to grab onto something and I want to move in that direction. There's an aiming. Yes. Yeah. And then too, it's that like I was thinking of different parts about all this and, and some jargon and stuff like, like that garbage in, garbage out, which fits. You know what? If I'm not mm -hmm. aware of the value of contemplation, if I'm not scheduling the yes. nothing, then I'm busy, 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 and I'm fueling myself with things like what am I listening to on the radio or yeah. what, what music am I paying yes. attention to it? What shows am I watching? Yeah. Books yeah. am I reading? Who am I hanging out with? Yes. And, and how is that influencing me? Yeah. And we can see all sorts of different ways that this is just true. Yeah. Um, everybody's watching hockey right now. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. So there's way more orange and blue and flags <laughs> on cars and stuff because we're we're contemplating on hockey and we're also just inviting that human experience in. And we're doing it together. And we're doing it together. And there's a sense of community. Yeah. And ideals even. And ideals. And so it feels good. It's like why why people like to run a race. I like to run a race. Part of what's cool about a race is there's a big crowd of people there. Yep. And I'm not as addicted as some people. And I'm, oh, not, yeah. as, I'm not very good either. <laughs> <laughs> but I get it. I get the sense of community. We're created for community. Well, and it's also our impulse to, to have heroes yeah. and idols. And, and right? if, if I'm not paying attention to what I'm contemplating on, if I'm just having things come in and my brain yeah. is naturally doing what it does and creating meaning and purpose and, and spiritual resourcing, I'm naturally drawn into such a community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. It's interesting. So, so we can talk really about contemplation is something you do. It's just, are you aware of it? You have heroes, you have idols, you have ideals, you have something that you're aiming to, but the question is, did you put it there or did someone else put it there? Because there are a lot of people that are really aware of how story shapes us, Yeah. right? So we talk about uh, everything that's going on with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We talk about what's going on in the tabloids. We talk about what's going on maybe with your favorite political activist or politician or your favorite sports team and inevitably who's your, who's your person on that sports team. Yeah. And we're aiming at them, right? And we're reflecting on them. Yeah. But if somebody's putting a story of who they think the ideal human is in front of you, and you haven't spent time to choose that, well, you're still aiming at them. You're still becoming, yes. you're still heading in that direction. Yeah. And it's in that moment, it's really interesting to kind of think about what's going on in the stories that we tell in our culture right now. What are, what are the, who are the, the models that are set before us. And yeah. we're really in a moment of anti-hero. Well, and it's true. Like I think of, of uh, for women, the influence of the Kardashian family. And, right. And it's just an interesting thing to notice how we are, uh, how we've changed fashion wise. And, mm -hmm plastic surgery wise and things like this like you can you can see the change over whatever they've been around 15 years whatever it is yeah i don't know <clears throat> and nothing i i'm not trying to say something that character assassinate any of these women no. however there's a power of that influence so yeah. what my attention goes to if somebody's been watching the uh, kardashians for 15 years or 
you know, some other television show where it's like, that's my thing. Yeah. The books that we're reading, all these things. Mm -hmm. our, our brain is wired to contemplate. I talk about putting things on the back burner of my brain. If I don't quite get it, I'm like, well, I'm just going to put that on my back burner because I know that there's a contemplative power back there. And sometimes my contemplated, contemplative mind just figures it out. Yep. Um, but there's, there's risk and reward. And then when we talked about the motion of emotion months back with everybody. Yeah. Right now I'm like, wow, there is so much momentum and motion with contemplation. It's, it's happening whether we're realizing it or not. And then it totally impacts our mental health. Yes. And it totally impacts our choices and our behaviors. Absolutely. Yeah. It, 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 it's a way of shifting the field of what our options even are. So, I mean, I, coming back to this idea of our cultural moment of the anti-hero, I think is really important because I see this also, I try to take a step back in politics. I, I don't even know how much I want to engage with politics, but what I, what I notice as somebody who cares a lot about stories and contemplation and how we, what, how we aim ourselves is that I don't want to vote for anybody right now because the only thing I see, and I, I know there's more than what I see, but the only thing I see is how everybody's pointing at what they don't want. And that's the, that's the direction we're aiming at, what we don't want. And we're paradoxically, but also if you think about driving instructor, we're aiming at what we don't want and that's the direction we're going. And there's very few people talking about, hey, let's actually talk about what we do want and where we are going. Yeah. Now, I know there's a lot of voices that do talk about that, but it's like, as like some total, like the, the momentum of our, of our society right now, we're heavy, we're burdened, we're, we're disillusioned. We, and I, I, I agree, and this is sort of, it fits too with that garbage in, garbage out sort of yeah. problem. And what are we being mindful of? Yes. So I think a lot about uh, violence. Yep. I think a lot about love and peace. I think a lot about racism, about yep. um, negative false lies, about m marginalized people groups. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I think a lot about feeling the pressure to forgive my brother because they look like me and I should have forgiveness with them as opposed to <clears throat> having compassion and experience with people who are different from me yeah and all these sorts of lies and strange thoughts that that I'm like I don't know you know I I, I need to think about those how do those fit with my ideals for humanity yeah what don't I agree with what were my what are my old views of self and others in the world that I need to get slow with to transform and then if slice I thin slice thin if i don't and i'm just like this and yeah. ignore it and turn on the tv or the news or the comedy yeah. podcast or the radio and it's just my brain is contemplating on something else and then there's my aim yeah yeah exactly and it's interesting that's how marketing manipulates us as well well, and social media. Social media, yes. Right? I mean, you take the age-old expression from news. Uh, if it bleeds, it leads. We're wired to pay attention to things that are mm -hmm. scary and dangerous and disgusting. Yeah. Because that's how we keep ourselves safe, or at least ideally. But then we turn up the volume with that through social media. And one of two things can happen. And I try to walk the fence between the two mm -hmm. when I use social media. Um, is we can create an echo chamber where we only ever hear things that we like that, that confirm our ideas or we get totally lost in everybody else's ideas and don't know what our own ideas are. Yeah. So yeah. I try to keep people on my Facebook, for example, that I'm like, I really don't agree with their vision of humanity. But if I don't know their vision of humanity, how do I interact with them? Yeah. If I and if I don't, and here's a, here's a crucial part too. If I don't know their vision of humanity, if I don't know of a possible other way of being human, how do I know that my vision actually works? Exactly. 
Exactly. And that, that buffering, and again, the community, which I'm surprised that's coming up here so profoundly that, that content, I think maybe just contentment and contemplation are require uh, an environment of community. Mm -hmm. I'm an attachment <laughs> of course I'm going to say well we need relationships <laughs> but Jordan Peterson mm. he's always on my peripheral I'm, I've never I haven't yet to really dive in but mm -hmm. actually you sent me some Jordan Peterson and I was mm -hmm. like well I should probably just follow him on I think the part of the allure to Jordan Peterson is number one he's he I would say he's a contemplator and yeah. he's a reflector. Yeah. Um, Sometimes and, I wish there was more of that there. He's no saint, that's for sure. No, yeah, but he he he's provocative in that he's like, here's a thought, yeah. and maybe maybe I baked this cake thought to a, you know a glorious state, and we can eat this thought, or maybe this is a half baked thought. And he yeah. Kind of throws yeah. things out there, and it's like, whoa, what do I I have to say? What do I think? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly it. Yeah. And what, like the other thing about thinking is it's fun. Yeah. If, well, I have learned to have a lot of fun with thinking. I have been, and this is, I think, coming back to attachment to community and contemplation. Even. I've been supported and allowing myself to explore thoughts without having to accept them. Right. A quote I heard really early on, it became like a core value for me is it's the mark of a wise mind to be able to understand something without having to accept it. Oh. Right. So in the really big decisions in my life, I, I try to, from a place of as much integrity as I have awareness of, try to say, do I understand it well enough on its own terms before I reject it? Because it's easy to reject your picture of something. Yeah. And that's the last thing I'd want somebody to do for me. But if they know me inside and out, then their opinion matters a lot more. And I want to be that kind of person too. Yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> it's so funny. It's like this, this experience that I have every so often where it's like, I don't know, it's this lovely wave that's cast over me. It's not painful, it's not an affront, but it's like, well, curiosity, we we can't give it enough credit no and i love that little quote or big quote mm -hmm. that is like do i really understand this enough to agree or disagree both ways exactly both ways both ways and like even when i brought up kardashians before like there's some things that are admirable and agreeable yeah and and lovely and then of course they're, they're you know billionaire celebrities it's just a given that there's some things that I'm going to say, wow, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And I mean, coming in from a somatic angle, mm -hmm. and we talk about contemplation, this is something I've really had to wrestle with a lot and in, in some big life stuff I'm going through right now as well, um, is <laughs> that we perceive, we sense this world, we perceive this world with a lot more than our reason. And contemplation has space for that, right? Con logic says, does it fit in my Excel sheet? Does it fit in my mental formula? If this, then this, yes, no. Yeah. Contemplation says, okay, that we have a category for that. We have some space for that, but there's more to being human than just that. Well, maybe that's my anthropology talking. But when we talk about how, does it, how, do I, how do I feel about this? How do I sense this? How does that fit together with my logic or come against it? Contemplation says, if I really aim at something for long enough, if I move in that direction long enough, more than just my logic changes, yeah. <clears throat> more than just my, my values change, more than just my reasons change, my experience changes. So when we talk about racism, for example, yes. right, I don't have the lived experience of somebody else that is part of a marginalized group. I don't, right? I have privilege there. So what do I point at and where do I locate myself yeah. to be able to, to make community, to know my limits, to meet the difference, 
but how do I contemplate the experience of somebody that I want to serve and that I want to be alongside and that I don't want to invalidate? And what are my ideals for humanity? Yes. For my own humanity. Because it's like, <laughs> yeah. if I'm a, a, a blonde haired, green eyed girl yeah. who's highly educated and runs a company and has a good enough family background and stuff like this, then, sure. yeah, I mean, like, people have been oppressed by women like me. Sure. Definitely. I mean, I've hurt people's feelings myself. It's not just fictional, right? But yeah. there's this this space to notice like I I'm a symbol of things to people mm -hmm. that have had experiences other than my own mm -hmm. and so what am I contemplating because the focus is really about loving people yeah I, I don't know but I know I can believe in the power of love yeah and so I can love on somebody now then with some of my um friends who have earned a lot of safety with and there's more appropriate space for curiosity and bantering and yeah and i can kind of get it wrong and they're like they trust my good intentionality that i'm I, I just love them and we're friends yeah but that's really earned absolutely and that and takes that's time not, that's more takes, than logic it takes time and contemplation and really with 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 race in particular it takes listening and it listens yes. circles are in a beautiful contemplation activity. They're yeah. shockingly contemplative. That reminds me, there's this beautiful concept in, I think, Finland. I wish I had the detail down. But it's a library that people sign up to be rented out for conversation. Right, I've seen this. Right, and it's this beautiful idea. It's like, hey, here's somebody who has these key features in their life story. Can I sit down with them and just listen to them share their life story? And that's a contemplation too. And then all kinds of stuff happens because then it's like, where do where our anthropologies clash? Where our ideals clash? That's where we say the least thinly sliced stuff. But that's also our best opportunity to say, well, does what I have work? Or is that a space that I can change or I can shift? Uh, one, one way this shows up is coming from a Christian background and having clients come to me and say, hey, you're a Christian. Or having people in my broader network say, hey, can you find me a Christian counselor? I always slow down, I always pause. And I do this very consciously and intentionally. I say, what does it mean to you to be a Christian? Because it's gonna be different yeah. than it does for me. Otherwise there wouldn't be all these different churches. And just because you go to XYZ church or you're part of XYZ denomination doesn't mean you agree or live according to that, everything that they state they do. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's contemplate that. Because my very thin, very broad word, Christian, can mean a million different things. And we're not aiming at anything with that word. Yeah, and, and most of, yeah, most of those things I don't know if I would define you as, you know, like there's these words that we use. And so it's like, well, what is that? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. You right. know? In what that, think, who is Tony? Who is Tony? And, and how do I think and feel about who I am and who you are? These sorts of things of that contemplation. Yeah. To make it really explicit what you're with the somatic view do you know we're relying on our senses it contemplation is is thinking is listening but it is you know mm -hmm. um what do i hear what do i feel mm -hmm. um what do i taste what do i uh help me out i'm losing my mind it's like what do i hear what do i feel what do i taste, taste I... touch see hear yeah. What, but it's also what don't I hear? What you don't I feel, know. right? Or how do I sense this, right? A big one that I've been talking to clients about a lot lately is this idea of satisfaction. Because that smell is, smells the one I miss, just like yeah. But. Well, satisfaction defies logic, and it's really important that it does because that we need reminders that we are more than just rational, logical human beings. That's a story we've been sold. We're yeah. more than that. So uh, the question I always offer, and this is worth contemplating, is what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? 
Is it vanilla? Is it chocolate? Is it strawberry? Is it metropolitan? Is it something else? And unless you're like lactose intolerant, high, or, or dealing with diabetes or something, it's like, oh, I, do I have an idea? But if you do, how do you know? What makes chocolate, say, for example, it's chocolate, what makes chocolate better than vanilla? Wow, oh, it just feels better in my stomach. That matters, right? Because that's the place where we, we make decisions from. It's really? interesting too, the ice cream analogy is, so there's two things. Number one, I think of these ice cream stores that have like 30 flavors because it's an opportunity for someone to come in and actually we're going to be contemplating, but we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so do we, how do we view, how are we wired? Mm -hmm. Are we wired towards chocolate? Because that's what everybody says. Chocolate's the best, chocolate's the best. Or Good do we actually sit there and say, what do I actually want? Yeah. I should get chocolate because I'm a grown woman, but I used to love Rocky Road, whatever it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, this came up in a particular example about how do I make a choice about career? Yeah. And I said, before we get there, let's talk about a menu. It's like, how, how does those connect? Right? There's a lot of careers you can choose. Most of us have the capacity to do a few different careers. Right. Maybe with a little bit of work here and there to get there. But how do you actually make a choice about something like that? It's the same way you sit in front of a menu and you got 20 items on this menu. And somehow, some of us have a really hard time with this and there's reasons for that. But you sit in front of a menu and say, what do I want to eat? A very simple, basic question. Somehow we make that decision. We say, hmm, burger with fries. And it's not a logic thing. We can make that choice. Well, people eat burgers and fries. But we can also stop and really slow down. Uh, an expression I like is moving at the speed of sensation because it's slower than time. Ooh, that's nice. Right? And if we move at the speed of sensation, a lot of contemplation can happen there. And we can sit and we can say, hmm, if I think about fish and chips, eh, it feels like my guts twist a little bit. I sense that. Yeah. Or it tightens up or it feels numb. Mm, if I think about the burger and fries, oh, it feels like things open up. It feels like things get a little warm. It feels, yes, it feels satisfying. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you've had enough to eat? This is a million dollar question for a lot of people. It's not a logic thing. We can talk, we can talk portion control from willpower and science, or we can say, hey, is there a point where after I have a bite, my body says yes until that bite, and after that bite, my body says no. This happens for me with fish and chips, for example. That's why I talk about fish and chips. If it's really oily, I can eat so much, and then I get a very clear signal from my stomach that says, nope, yeah. try that next bite, and you're going to regret it. Nope. Stop here. Mm, satisfaction. Maybe even some contentment. All right? But that's a, a capacity for us as humans that we really lose if we focus just on logic and reason. So with this, what I'm hearing, it's like this, this, when we use our senses and our way of being, whether all of them, including smell, <laughs> yes. um, we, that, that leads into our contemplation. Like contemplation is really yeah. this slowing down. It's a cultural yeah. problem to move way too fast. So with Tony's mm -hmm. really thinly sliced metaphor or truth mm -hmm. i'm contemplating in this experience because i'm listening to my body and how my body is sensing into what's happening mm -hmm. and then i can have contentment yeah yeah and so it's it's so powerful that it could easily be missed the, the value of sensing and contemplating and how that leads into contentment. So some of what we're noticing with contemplation, okay, so is the senses. Yeah. And then getting really slow. Yeah. When you talked about ice cream earlier, um, all these great metaphors, and this just feels more like how you and I talk, right? <laughs> yeah. like, oh my word, we're just, <laughs> this is what we do. This is an offering. Yeah. Um, but when you mentioned ice cream, I thought of back in the 90s, Sarah McLaughlin, hmm. big, big Canadian artist, lots of people love Sarah yep. McLaughlin. She was yep. she's awesome. 
it's the ice cream stuff. Your love is better than ice cream, better than anything uh. I've ever known. And that song, I remember hearing it and loving it and like wanting it to come on the radio. Mm-hmm. Try it, try and tape it on a, a, ta- a cassette tape. Yes. But it was, um, it, it, it was vivid. It was, mm-hmm. it's, it's a contemplative lyric. Yes. Your love is better than ice cream. Oh, I can sense that. Good I story can, does that. I can think about it. Exactly. I can philosophize what type of love would be so contented that it would be better than ice cream. Well, exactly. And this is where, when I'm talking with clients, something that gets, that I really hone in on, that I really try to slice thin, is a question like, where in your life do you know this experience? So it's like, oh, I'm trying to find the right partner romantically. And, or a big theme actually is, what does it feel like to have somebody have your back, to have support in a way that you actually need? And is there a time in your life where you have that? Because we're looking for a lot of people at that point, we're looking for the exception to the rule and we're trying to blow the exception way up so that it takes up more space because that exception is part of how we sense good relationships, healthy relationships. Our default can be working really hard and not having anybody have our back. That'll feel familiar and familiar can feel comfortable, but healthy, and contented is actually in a different place. And then this contemplation, uh, contemplation is, is fueled by curiosity or with it. I don't know which one I'd say. However, mm. curiosity is so powerfully connected to contemplation. And then I can r- take these risks to get slow and yeah. notice my faulty thinking perhaps, or just sit with what are my ideals for my humanity yeah and so if i'm contemplating on on those qualities rather than just go go going and not slowing down yes so that's like how do we contemplate i think we're answering that but are we being concrete enough so here's a concrete example that you just reminded me of and it goes back to one of the most frustrating moments i had with the mutual mentor of ours and he said to me, because I was talking about something and I looked at him and I'm like, I'm confused. And he looked back with his glinting eyes and he smiled at me. He's like, good. And I'm like, good that I'm confused? What the heck? Why is that a good thing? He says, because if you weren't, you'd just be rehearsing stuff you already know. Confusion allows you to learn something new. And I'm like, totally. So curiosity and confusion have to go hand in hand. And this creates space for for not knowing, which is scary, and for allowing mystery. But that's scary, that mystery, that not knowing, that curiosity. They hold the capacity for something new, right? That allows something new to be born into this world that's may actually work for you better than the suffering that you're going through right now. Yeah, yeah. And it takes great faith to doubt. I, I, mm. And doubting is a big part of faith and contemplation and confusion. It's like, like you said previously, do I understand this enough to deny or accept it? Yeah. And so it's like, do I, do, am, I, am I listening and being and sensing into this enough to experience it enough that I am confused? Yes. Are and we then, willing to wander in the wilderness for a while before we actually land somewhere? Yeah. And I, I guess, too, when you introduce confusion, that part of just really trying to say, how do you contemplate is it's quite confusing to outline. It's a spiritual yeah. practice. Yeah. Absolutely. It it is about, there's stillness, there's silence, um, and there's, there's space to just be present with ourselves in one moment. Yeah. That's meditative and prayerful. I recently have been sharing this with clients of like back again in the nineties, I'd buy an album 
or CD, I should say, <laughs> tape or CD. We, you know. Yeah. I have. We're, we're in the 90s. Yeah, we're <laughs> in the 90s. And laying on a bed and listening to an album. Yeah. Front to back, the way it was meant to, to be. And there's these, so because part of that too, the experience of the story and what this artist is trying to get you to contemplate on or piece together experience in the music. Mm -hmm. um, but also like laying on a bed for an hour yeah and those those old more diligent practices of, of piety i would say mm -hmm. contemplation takes piety it takes some like discipline discipline and some some diligence. structure yeah, yeah setting aside uh, uh, again a lot of especially when i'm working with burnout I'm working with people on scheduling nothing. Yes. So many people, it's like so many people don't schedule nothing. No. no. Right. I mean, that that space, that margin, that the the capacity to to slow down and rest is so important. Right. You talking about that. This is a conversation I have with clients a lot recently for for their care. I look at them and I say, I'm not working at 100 percent capacity right now. And that's by design. And they're like, what? And I say it's by design, because if my schedule fills up and you hit an emergency and you need to see me, yeah. I need to have the capacity to see you. And that's why I don't work at 100 percent. Right. And life happens. This is this is life. My 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 job is a huge part of my life, and I love it. Right? Uh, right. Let's go down a rabbit hole there too. But if you look at life as a whole, is saying, okay, do we have enough structure and discipline to have margin in our life for when life happens? Exactly. I love the piece about capacity. Boy, we are really using a lot of c words too. I'm just going to throw that. Considering <laughs> and, capacity. Hey, if you're hanging in <laughs> with us, yeah, if you're hanging in with us in this conversation, I I think it's really curious. Like it's got a lot of interesting pieces, but mm -hmm. capacity, capacity is huge. And and uh, like my master's research, my thesis was on the wellness wheel, and yeah. I, I it's so interesting how often I go back to that old little evaluation tool. This is a reflection tool. And it's a good assessment of my ideals for my humanity. How am I yeah. doing socially? How am I doing emotionally, intellectually, physically, mm -hmm. occupationally, all my capacity things and spiritually. Yeah. And so we can, we need a diligence, a piety to take meetings with ourselves to reflect on the who am I and what are the I or what is my I am and what are the I am not that I'm yeah. allowing to drive my life? Yeah. We, t we, if we're so, so busy that we're not slowing down, we have way more I am nots in church. I'm mm. not good enough. I'm not mm -hmm. perfect enough. I'm not I don't have enough enough. energy. I don't have enough energy. I'm a shitty mom. Mm -hmm. I'm a terrible, like mm -hmm. we can just mm -hmm. live in the mm -hmm. I am nots. Yeah. And then we are so busy that we're, fueling our, ourselves with crap music and terrible tv and all these things and our brains contemplating on that and it just feels the i am not yeah whereas how do we build space for nothing for thinking yeah. when's the last time you laid on your bed and listened to yeah. music for 20 minutes or an hour what When's the last time you actively allowed yourself to be part of the scenery and get curious about something new? Yeah, when's the last time, like, I think to our beds, like, yeah. it, again, in college, when I was in college, we didn't have TVs. Yeah. So there would be times where I would be laying on my dorm bed. Yeah. Sometimes chatting with one of my dorm mates, sometimes just like, I'm just doing nothing. Yeah. And, and it's a lost art. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? It's when do you get time to slow down and say, am I actually even pointed in the direction I want to be going? 
it the other day it was mind blowing. So Eliana, my daughter, wanted to do some chalk art on our driveway. So she's doing chalk art. I'm doing that. I I'm too old. It's like I have to bend over and things. It's hard. And the knees and the back. Yeah. So I did a bit. And then I I chose to lay back on the grass and look at the clouds. And I was cloud watching, right? I can't remember last time I've done that. And it was fascinating. And I was thinking about the clouds. And I was thinking about the edges of the clouds Mm -hmm. and wondering about weather systems and wondering about if this cloud keeps gathering. When does it get so big that it'll be a storm cloud in Saskatchewan and Manitoba? And I, it was so contemplative and meditative. Yeah. And good for stress. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and so these things, again, when's the last time you've laid back and looked at the clouds or the stars? Yeah. You have gone down to the river valley and watched the river. Yeah. You're lucky enough to be by the ocean and watch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Just slowing down, letting whatever's inside bubble up and go move on through. And that sensing, that was a sensing experience that I The had. grass, the wind, all of it. The light, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have a blog I did, I, and it's just about the calm place, which is a trauma activity we do. <laughs> but that, the contemplation is about, I, I feel adrenaline i feel panic i feel pain and i need to figure out how to get into this calm place mm-hmm. you know to sit on to sit on my beautiful couch mm-hmm. for five minutes and just be yeah that's hard so hard. we so let's talk about that for a moment because <laughs> i i really want to I think even for myself, I'm still growing in this. I'm still getting some some more clarity here. Yeah. There's nothing good C-word. Um, but even for anybody who managed to listen this far, it's like, how how do we go from redlining the engine of our, of our nervous system to being able to drop the revs, gear shift down, drop the revs, gear shift down, drop the revs, maybe even to park for a little bit so that we can rest the engine yeah. and then we can reorient and we can say that sign says i'm heading to calgary i wanted to go to jasper huh good thing i noticed that sign now i have to turn around right that's what the margin is good for mm-hmm. so how do we get there how how do how do you help clients rev down for lack of better terms i i mean part of so part of what we're talking about too here what i hear when you say this is is really highlighting and knowing our window of tolerance knowing our person that capacity the clarity obviously we did not plan the c words they're just happening. <laughs> um but <laughs> now, that space and and then i i mean literally when i used to talk about or when i do talk about window of tolerance look at it as like a scale there's minus 10 positive 10 and yeah. here's my window which is about minus three to positive three if i can stay in that zone i'm feeling pretty good yeah, yeah. but how do i know when i'm outside yeah and what are the ingredients of my window of tolerance so that's the contentment space mm. and if i'm not mindfully contemplative of me and mm-hmm. you and we Mm-hmm. If I am, I'm not in that contemplative space to get slow and just be present and sense. Yeah. Then I lose track of my wellness wheel and dreams. Yeah. But my wellness wheel is inside my window of tolerance. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's a better answer than I thought I'd have. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I love it. And what I, I want to kind of just add to it is like, so this is the real positive answer. But there's also the negative side of it too. Yeah, go, yes. Right? Is we slow down and then everything that we've been running from pops up. And it that's probably that's will. what bubbles up. Yeah, it probably will. Right. And it should. I actually think it should. Now, I mean, this is part of what therapy is about is somebody holding that space with you so that you can allow it to bubble up and move on its merry way. 
there's community again. But even if you can manage to do that on your own, that's the value of it. I mean, that's more of the reflection piece. The reflection and contemplation can go like this. It's, this is what I'm shooting at, where am I? And if this crap is bubbling up, well, I guess it's better to deal with it now mm -hmm. than to pile on a whole bunch more crap before I even realize I'm doing that. Yeah. I think I, that's one thing I would say. I think too, it's like, especially right now when we're emerging from all this yes. yeah. chaotic trauma experience. That's what I'm that, thinking of. Um, when we do get slow, uh, when people tell me they're doing fine and stuff or they, they have been saying that, I'm like, I don't know how to believe you. Um, I do see a lot of people who have worked through their vulnerable pain and their problems during COVID and they're doing pretty good right now. Like, yeah. yeah. But when we, when we are North American workaholic, caregiver, holic, materialistic, um, false religion type people then we're going to be outside our window of tolerance when we actually get slow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's a, a really interesting thought that even came up um on on that is it even talking about our priorities mm -hmm. priorities is an aim thing right and uh, a person I was listening to when they were talking about it was saying that you can have priorities that aren't bad priorities, but if a sub priority becomes your main priority, then yeah. and you shoot at that, you're going to miss everything below and everything above because the system is all whack. But if you shoot at the highest ideal, yeah, right. In, in Christianity, it's if if you're contemplating Jesus which is hard for Christians to do. Let's put it out there. <laughs> it's hard for everybody. Right? But if, if that's what you're contemplating for any given length of time, then that's the direction you're, you're, you're going. But we can make other things, ideals that we spend more time on that take more place there. And that can be your category of quote-unquote idolatry. But what functionally ends up happening is we major in the minor. We minor in the major. And we become like what we're shooting at, but we're shooting too low. Yeah. Yeah. And if and we shoot too low, we suffer. We suffer. And it, it, you know, like if our life becomes unmanageable, and that's that's language from the DSM and from a addiction culture that yeah. my, life, my life's unmanageable. I'm overdoing something, I'm overemphasizing, I am over dissociating or drugging out or, you know, I'm moving away. I, I think it was the seven habits of highly effective people, old 90s leadership stuff, mm -hmm. where there's this Jahari window. And I, I'm having a little moment remembering when I was in college and this prof talked about a Jahari window and I was like, oh, I just feel so smart for knowing <laughs> And they're interesting. It's funny. I'm like, why was I so fascinated with these jarry windows? But basically, it's like a chart where we propose negative and positive charges mm -hmm. with two, two pieces of content. So urgent, immediate. Mm -hmm. So if we're, you know, urgent, immediate, uh, non-urgent, non-immediate. And then there's a variety of like non-urgent, immediate, um, non-immediate, urgent. Mm -hmm. But if we're always sort of stuck in what's urgent, the urgent, urgent, urgent. And prior to COVID, I think this is a common complaint that I would hear from parents. So just go, go, going with this yeah. urgent, get my kid here, get my kid there, do, 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 do. So they're always in the urgent. But there's, if we're only in the urgent, then we're omitting contemplation. Mm. Mm. I think. I think mm -hmm. I really, I think. Yes, I no, I omission. absolutely. Because it, it's one of those spiritual disciplines. It's a piety. It's a piousness. Yeah. It's a little old gray haired grandma who would keep her Bible on her kitchen table. Yeah. You know, or, or the, you know, it's Mother Teresa. Yeah. The work that she did would have taken deep contemplation. Yeah. But there's a slowness 
slowness and a spiritual responsibleness. And, and it's in that non-urgent. How do I create non-urgence in my life? Mm. And, and how do I value that? Mm. And I, an ideal of my humanity is to create non-urgence in my life. So I don't know how, because that's, I think, so specific to each person. But, yes. the, but valuing, one thing I would say is that if we're contemplating, we're creating space for awe, and we can link back to our shame series a little bit on that, mm-hmm. um, and all the benefits that it has for our nervous system to actually be in awe, of prototypical worship. Um, but we also create space for gratitude. Yeah. So, and, and gratitude. Also, the amount of time we spend in awe, the amount of time we spend in gratitude, both of those are like miracle growth for your nervous system and for everything that's good about your nervous system, everything that's healthy and functional and resilient yeah. about our nervous system. And if we don't take time to contemplate, it's really hard to actually, to, to be a bit metaphorical, to dwell, to live in gratitude. Right. I think that's part of the value of contemplation and saying, where am I going? What's beautiful in life? What takes my breath away in the best ways? Yeah. And here we go. We're introducing words of a different letter. Gratitude. Hey. And then obviously, I mean, I, I, addiction theory and recovery is one of my passions. Yeah. Gratitude and serenity. And to me, I'm like gratitude and serenity and contemplation. It's, they go full circle. Mm-hmm. And because gratitude, serenity, contemplation really the, are gold, are aimed towards contentment. Yeah. 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 And loving and accepting. Oh, totally. Yeah. Right. You can have a lot of crap going on in your life, as we all do. Yeah. I know. Gratitude that. doesn't change the crap, but yeah. it, it creates so much more space for contentment for you. It's a, it's a spiritual practice, but it's it's interesting because I think about body positivity and the, mm. the weight I've gained in COVID. Mm. Which, Me too. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not content with it. And then I feel irritated that I, I feel bad that I would be viewed as not body, body positive because mm. I don't accept my weight. Mm. And then I was thinking, you know, how do I have body positivity in, in that I love and I do accept me and my body as I am, that I do feel positive about the body that I'm in, mm-hmm. um, but I'm not content with my mm-hmm. weight. Mm-hmm. I'm not committed. I'm not committed to the weight that I gained in COVID. Oh, there's nothing to see word. Yeah. I think it's more that I'm not committed to this, this thing this is not my ideal for my humanity. This is not, it, it was about lacking contemplation. That's how it happened. Yeah. And, and I wasn't experiencing eating and noticing the stop sign. I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't putting good in and getting good out. Yeah, there was yeah, some yeah. secret garbage in, garbage out stuff going on in, in my life that I was not being cognizant of. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, well, I'm not committed to this. And I can feel really good about my body, but I'm going to have to work on that because I'm not committed to something that I don't like about myself, that I did to myself. Mm -hmm. And yet I love myself. So my self-love is challenged right now, but getting slow. I've been getting slow with this for a few days. Mm -hmm. And when I noticed that word committed, I was like, oh my word, I just feel so good being me when I notice that it's okay to not be committed to weight gain and still have utter self-love. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This this is reminding me of some some other stuff I had to dig into a while back. Because body positivity, man, that's a really... You save it for another day. Right. Right. So on contemplation and gratitude, right? If we don't slow down, and, and contemplate something outside of us. Yeah. If we don't know where we're getting our stories from, 
that our ideal humanity can be our body. Our idea, and, and if we're not paying attention, then, then we're living in the I am not. Yeah. We're living in negative beliefs about ourselves, others in the world. We are new form. Yeah. We are watered down. Yeah. yeah. When it, and if, if our body is the vehicle we talk about each other and think about each other, and it's we miss out on the humanity of somebody saying to you, I'll love you even if you feel ugly to yourself. Yeah, and then and trusting that and that I can say I do not, I'm not committed to the weight I gained in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I can still, I'm still lovable and loving. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and curious and contemplation and all these lovely things. Yeah. Okay, this is we we've done a lot here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is the, the frequency I like running on. This is just a normal Tuesday for Tony and I. Like, it's like, yeah, that's, how, that's why we just turn the camera on because it's like, that's what we do. Okay, lots more re more things we could have gone. We slightly touched on shame and contentment or in contentment. Community. And, you know, what, all the C it, words. All the C words. Uh, but thank you, Tony. This was helpful. And uh, I, and, and I, I love to be mindful with you and just, I love to be mindful. I think if that's one of the challenges with people is get slow, get big, thinking, Curious. get seen, use your senses. Hmm. So nourishing. So this nourishing. was so nourishing. Go to the ice cream store and, hmm. and just experience it yeah. and then think about it. Absolutely. Okay, take care, Tony. You too. Bye, Tara.